Greetings everyone, Bruno Luce here with GLB Productions. Thanks for joining us for this video. This is the second video in our series on DI boxes. In the first video in this series, we discussed what a DI box does and why you might need one. In this video, we're going to discuss the difference between active and passive DI boxes. How are they different in terms of construction and operation and how you would employ them in a sound reinforcement situation. On the table in front of you, you can see a number of DI boxes. You'll recognize two of them from the first video, and the second one is a newcomer. In order, they are the BSS Audio AR133, an active DI box, the Radial JDI, a passive direct box, and the Whirlwind IMP2, also a passive direct box. All three of these are very commonly found in the world of sound reinforcement and two of them are considered industry standards for pro audio. So let's begin by discussing the design differences between active and passive DIs. By definition, an active DI box uses an active circuit to do the work that a DI does, namely signal balancing and impedance matching. Active DI boxes, because they use an active circuit, need a source of power. This can be either an internal battery or external phantom power, or in the case of some tube DIs, they have a dedicated external power supply. Passive DIs, on the other hand, use a transformer to do the signal balancing and impedance matching, and as a result, require no external power whatsoever. So how do you identify whether you're dealing with an active or a passive DI box. Well, the first thing that you should do is you should actually look at the lettering on the box itself. Very often on good DI boxes, it will tell you whether it is an active or passive design. You can see here on the BSS, it says active DI box. And here on the radial, it says passive direct box there. That will take the guesswork out of doing things. If it doesn't say, such as on this whirlwind, you can see it simply says direct box without any indication of whether it's active or passive, this is when you have to get a bit more creative. If you happen to have internet access at the time, you can jump on the web and do a search to see whether the DI is an active or passive design. Failing this, you need to look at the DI box itself. Most active DI boxes can be identified by one of three features that they will have. LEDs, light emitting diodes, an on-off switch, and some kind of battery compartment. So if we begin by looking at the BSS, you can see that on the front of the BSS, it actually has an LED. Right next to the power switch there, you see there is a red LED. When the power is switched on, the LED glows and then it begins to flash. This will glow steadily if the DI is being powered with phantom power. Otherwise, it will flash to indicate that the unit is running off its internal battery. The presence of an LED is a sure sign that the DI is an active design. The second thing which will allow you to identify an active DI box is the presence of an on-off switch. Now, passive DIs, because they require no external power, do not have on-off switches and are always functional. Active DIs, on the other hand, need to be switched on or powered up. Now, in the case of some DI boxes, such as the LA Audio DI2, the on-off switch is integrated into the input connector. So when you plug into the DI, the circuit within it switches on. But usually, if you can see an on-off switch or a power switch, that's a sure sign that it is an active DI. The third thing that will allow you to identify an active DI box is the presence of a battery door. Now, as you can see here, in the case of this design, there is a very 
obvious battery door which has a thumb wheel used to change the battery. If you use active DI boxes, it's a very good idea to put a label on them indicating when the battery was changed and to change the batteries out at least once a year. Once again, not all DI boxes have this. In the case of the LA Audio model that I mentioned, the batteries are accessed by undoing two screws and removing the end plate on one side of the DI box. In that case, you won't know uh, that it's an active DI because there is no obvious battery door. Some DIs, such as the Clark Technic DN100 and the Radial J48, do not have any provision for battery powering. The reason for this is that battery powering presents some challenges and limitations to the maximum input signal that the DI box can handle. So some manufacturers decide to go with a phantom power only circuit in order to raise the rail voltage or the maximum input signal that the DI box can have. While we're on the subject of batteries and active DIs, is it a good idea to have a battery capability? In my opinion, it can be very useful. In this part of the world, Southeast Asia, where I live and I work, we still regularly encounter PA systems which do not have phantom power, either because the mixer is so old that it does not supply phantom power, or because the mixer is in a remote, inaccessible location, such as a locked room, and you cannot actually physically access the mixer to switch on the phantom power. In these cases, having a battery supply can be invaluable. The other thing about having a battery supply is that it allows you to use the DI box in unconventional ways where battery power may not be available. For example, this particular DI box, as you can see, it actually has an XLR input connector. The great thing about this is that it allows this DI box to be used as a line balancer. For example, where you're connecting one mixer to another mixer in a remote location and you need to balance the line in order to be able to lift the ground. In a case like that, you might not have phantom power available and it's very nice to have an onboard capability. Now that we've discussed the features that you would see on a typical active DI box, we can look at the passive models. Now, as you can see on this radial JDI, there is no power switch and no LEDs. It does have a fair number of switches though because this is a fairly full-featured direct box. Many simple passive direct boxes like this Whirlwind are extremely austere with probably just one switch, in this case used to lift the ground, a pair of jack connectors, an input and an output, they are wired in parallel so you can use either one and a single XLR connector on one end. That's the layout for passive DI boxes. So if you see this really really simple, no LEDs, no switches or maybe just one switch, chances are it's a passive direct box. So now that we know how to identify active and passive DI boxes, what about application? How do we know whether to choose an active or a passive direct box for a given source instrument or signal? There are two things that affect our choice, and these are a direct result of the design and technology that is used in the direct boxes. The first thing that we need to know is that passive direct boxes have a much lower input impedance than active direct boxes. Input impedance is resistance as applied to an alternating current such as a sound wave. Active DI boxes usually have input impedances between 1 and 10 mega ohms. If you look at the literature that comes with the BSS DI box, you will see there that it's stated one mega ohm. 
Now there is a pad switch which enables you to drop the sensitivity of the DI box but this also drops the input impedance to 47 kilo ohms. In the case of passive DI boxes, they have an input impedance an order of magnitude lower than that of active direct boxes. In the case of the JDI, looking at the documentation, you can see there that it has an input impedance of about 140 kilo ohms. This is simply because an active circuit can be designed to offer a much higher input impedance than can a passive transformer. The second thing is that passive direct boxes are much better at handling high level inputs such as those produced by active acoustic guitars, active bass guitars and keyboards. This is because a transformer will tend to saturate and as Peter Janis of Radial says round out rather than distort. Active circuits once they reach their clipping or overload points will begin to sound really quite ugly. So these are the two things that influence our choice of an active or a passive direct box. So in general, if your source is active, you choose a passive direct box. If your source is passive, you use an active direct box. Now what do we mean when we say active and passive sources? I have here two guitars that I'll be using to demonstrate this concept. The guitar on the left is a Takamine TSF48C, seen in some other videos on my channel, and the guitar on the right is our old faithful Taylor GS Mini, equipped with the ES Go pickup system. Now the Takamine is an example of an active source. As you can see, this guitar has an onboard battery powered preamp which boosts the signal level and you can tell that it's active because number one it has a battery compartment and it also has an active onboard tuner. So something like this would be considered an active source. Other examples of active sources would be active bass guitars as well as anything that is mains powered, for example a keyboard, a sampler, a CD player or an MP3 player. Passive sources on the other hand, like this GS Mini, as you can see this GS Mini does not have any onboard electronics. All it has is a magnetic sound hole pickup that is then connected directly to the output connector of the guitar. There's no battery in or on the guitar and there are no active tone or volume controls. Other examples of a passive source would be a passive jazz or precision bass as well as a Fender Stratocaster or Telecaster without any form of preamp. Now if you plug a guitar like that into a battery powered effects pedal it becomes an active source. So a passive guitar connected to any form of battery powered pedal should be treated as an active source. Similarly line level outputs of any kind such as those from amplifiers or indeed from mixing consoles also count as active sources. So now that we have a rule, let's break this rule down and find out why we have it as well as what happens when we don't follow it. First of all, why do we use passive DIs with active sources? The reason for this is mainly level control. Most of the time, we will be connecting our DI box to a microphone input on our mixing console. As you can see here, I have my JDI hooked up to channel 2 of my Mackie 1202 VLZ Pro. Because we are running into a microphone input, it's important to present that input with something as close to a mic level signal as possible. Now when I say mic signal, I refer to something that is 
between 0 0.01 and 0.1 volts. Line level is around 1 volt. When you plug an active source into a passive DI, it drops the level to near microphone level. So in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to disconnect the mic cable from the DI and I'm going to plug it into a standard SM58. And what we're going to do now is we're going to do the gain setting procedure on this channel. So I will press solo and as you can see the rude solo light begins to flash. And now I'm going to talk into the microphone and I'm going to turn up the trim or gain control on the mixer. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, three, four, check one, two. And as with all analog mixers, we want to aim for somewhere around zero dB. Uh, if you'd like to know more, you can watch my video, How to Set Gain on the Mixing Console. Now, as you can see here, we have a gain or trim setting, which is somewhere around one o'clock. And this is fairly typical for most analog mixers. So what we're now gonna do is I'm gonna disconnect the microphone and I'm gonna plug it back into the DI box. Disconnecting the microphone and reconnecting to the DI box. So I'm now going to connect the TSF48C, our active guitar, to this direct box. Here's the TSF48C. Take my uh, guitar cable and I'm going to connect it to this guitar. Now, if we repeat the gain setting procedure, remember now we have the Takamine plugged into this. I'm going to set the preamp on the Takamine to maximum with the cool tube at 50% and the EQ set flat. Now, the cool tube preamp is notorious for generating high signal levels. Uh, they once measured it and they found that it had an output of about seven volts. So let's see how that does when connected through the JDI. Remember, I haven't touched the trim control. Now we're a bit high, so I'm going to back it down. I'll back it down to about 12 o'clock. Okay, so as you can see there, the difference between the microphone gain and the guitar gain was not all that much. It was uh, the difference between rolling it from one o'clock down to about 12 o'clock. Let's see what happens when we connect the TSF48C to an active DI box. Okay, so I'm going to release the solo switch. Make sure the channel is muted. Unplug my connectors. Here comes the BSS, plug that in, and remember this box has an on-off switch, so we're going to make sure that's switched on. Okay, so now we have the same setup, TSF48C into active DI box. I have not touched the gain, it's still at about 12 o'clock. Let's see where our level is now. Now as you can see there, with the active guitar plugged through the active DI box, we have a very, very hot signal. And this is sometimes capable of overloading certain mic preamps, I think particularly of the Yamaha MG series mixes. On some of those mixes, you will turn the uh, gain control all the way down and still have level issues. So that's the main reason why you use a passive DI with active instruments. 
One of the main reasons why I make this recommendation is that certain people work in environments where the sound engineers are, shall we say, not very knowledgeable and they don't know how to set gain. If that's the case, you can show up with a passive direct box like this and just tell the guy, look, set your gain as you would for an SM58 and he'll usually be able to get it somewhere in the ballpark rather than showing up with an active DI box and having a whole bunch of distortion to boot. Okay, so we've learned why we use passive DIs with active sources. What about the other side of the rule where we use active DIs with passive sources? The main reason for this is to avoid the loss of high frequencies. You recall that passive DI boxes have relatively low input impedances compared to active ones. If you plug a passive guitar, like our GS Mini, into a passive DI, you can sometimes experience high frequency loss because of the input impedance mismatch. It is generally recommended that for passive instruments, you have an input impedance of around 1 mega ohm. This is the input impedance of your typical boss pedals as well as typical units like your Sansamp bass driver DI or para DI units. So let's see how this sounds in practice. We've already got the BSS AR133 hooked up, so I'm going to take my GS Mini. Remember, the GS Mini is a passive instrument. It has a magnetic sound hole pickup, no onboard electronics, and I will connect this to the DI. Now, our gain is already set from when we had the Takamine Active guitar connected, so let's see uh, how our levels are now. We'll depress solo. Now as you can see, with a passive guitar into an active DI, we have a much more manageable signal level. In fact, those of you with uh, keen eyes will have noticed that the level with the passive guitar into the active DI is exactly the same as that of the active guitar into the passive DI. So this helps to streamline your setup and keeps your levels as uniform as possible. Now let's listen to the sound. For this next part, you'll be hearing the output of the mixer connected directly to the video camera. Okay, so now you've heard what the GS Mini sounds like through an active DI box. Let's hear what it sounds like through our passive DI box. Okay, we've got the passive DI box connected. Let's first check our gain. So we depress solo. Zoom in a little bit so that you can see the meters. I'll play the GS Mini. So you can see that with a uh, passive guitar through a passive DI box, we have a very, very low signal level. And I'll probably need to turn that up to about 2 o'clock to compensate. Still a little bit low, turn it up some more to 2.30. Okay, so you'll notice that when you have a passive instrument into a passive DI, chances are is that you'll need to run your gain control pretty hot. And with cheaper mixers especially, this can introduce a lot of noise. And with some cheaper gain controls which are not very linear, working near the top of the scale, generally above 3 o'clock, can yield some quite unpleasant results with the gain jumping sky high for no apparent reason. Now let's listen to the sound.
Now depending on the quality of your playback system, you may or may not have been able to hear, but the sound of the GS Mini through the passive direct box was somewhat darker or cloudier or muddier than it was through the active DI box. Now this is due to that impedance mismatch which we discussed earlier. So this is why we choose the boxes that we do. Once again, to reiterate, as a general rule, if you have an active source, you use a passive DI. If you have a passive source, you use an active DI. This is Bruno Luce for GLB Productions. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.